of Proverbs in the 17th chapter. Proverbs 17. Again, I don't know how long tonight's message will be. It was um, kind of a last minute thing. Like I said, I was expecting Brother Joe to be able to teach, so... Lord, help me put something together. So we'll look at verses 8, 9, and 10, I believe, tonight. Yeah, 8, 9, and 10. Let's go ahead and read them. And we'll see what the Lord has for us. A gift is a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. Oh, Father, help us to understand your word tonight. Help us to believe your word tonight. Help us to receive your word tonight. And help us to live it hereafter. We ask in Jesus' name. Verse 8 says, A gift is a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. So this verse here now, it, there's a couple of different approaches you can take with the verse. And I'm going to give you both approaches. There is a practical approach, uh, and then there is a, a doctrinal approach. And they're actually completely opposite one from the other. So, in the practical approach, it would be a negative verse. In the doctrinal, it would be a very positive verse. And bear with me as I show you the difference. So, let's start with the negative and move on to the positive. The negative approach is that this gift here, anyone know what the gift is in reference to? Verse 17 will help you along, or verse 23 of the same chapter will help you along. Look down at verse 23. Yes. A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom, verse 23 says, to pervert the ways of judgment. So it's about, you know, it's that type of a gift. It can be taken in that sense. And take a look at Proverbs 18 while we're flipping around here. In verse 16, A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. The, the point of that is that it, it gives him a door. It gives him, it gives him an inn. You know, it may be a corrupt one, but it gives him gives him gives uh, gives him company with great men. All you got to do is think politics, right? And not even we're not even talking about handshake with a hundred dollar bill in it. Well, I'm talking about you know the even shadier deals that are done out in the open. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, kickbacks, government. You scratch, help me in my campaign, and I'll make sure money funnels this way. I'll make sure that your company gets the business, or you know, that stuff drives me nuts. And they're all doing it. Um, but so the gift here, in the negative sense, and in a practical way, it's a bribe, and it's a precious stone. It means it's a diamond, it's gold. What does that mean? It's money! You know, what makes the world go round, unfortunately the love thereof, whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Your money works for you. And that's just, the, that's just the way of the world. The more money you have, the more it will work for you. You want to work smarter, not harder, those types of things. So, but that's the general gist of this. It's, it's not necessarily a positive thing. It just, it just is. It's a way of the world. Lord gives you that information. Usually Ecclesiastes more deals with the life under the sun, you know, and and the shrewdness of things and crudeness of things. But now, this is the part that I like. This is the positive end of it. And I had to just completely ignore the fact that in verse twenty three we're obviously dealing with a bribe. Uh, in Proverbs 18, we're dealing with a bribe and in the, with the use of the word gift. And I had to turn my thinking around with that to get to the doctrinal application. So now, a gift. 
all right? The way we ought to be thinking about a gift. Not an earned prize, not a payment, not an ill-gotten gain, not a bribe, but something given in love and received with thanksgiving. It's a gift, right? Um, look at James 1.17. James 1.17. Every good what? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So is God bribing everyone? Obviously the word gift doesn't always mean a bribe, right? In fact, it usually doesn't. But every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. See, the Lord isn't bribing anyone. He doesn't need to curry any favor. What he's giving is a good and a perfect gift, of which a bribe is not. But he gives the good gifts, he gives the perfect gifts, and they come from above. Okay, now John 3. If you don't already know where I'm going, I've told you this over and over and over again. If, you're lo if I'm telling you, hey, let's find the doctrinal application and we're in the Old Testament, where do you think I'm going to point you? Yes, Jesus. John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave. It's a gift. His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is, He literally is, that good and that perfect gift that has come down from above, given by the Father of lights. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the... It's the gift of God. That's Ephesians 2.8. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift, the Apostle cries out in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15. And that gift, that gift is a precious stone. Now, go to 1 Peter. So the Father gave what? He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So His Son is the gift, right? And that gift is a precious stone. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, verses 3 down through 8. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and what? Precious. This, this Jesus is a precious stone. Ye also as lively stones are built... Well, not tonight so much. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, where, there's that word again, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So this stone is precious in the eyes of him that hath it. Go back to that proverb. The gift is a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Do you have that stone? Do you have that gift? Have you received it? But to those who don't, he's a stone of stumbling. He's not a precious rock. He's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So how about that? And that gift prospers no matter which way the matter turns. So what do you mean by that? Look, I'm saved. There's a lot of prayer requests that went out today that were, I guess for lack of better terms, negative in nature. This person's sick. This person was, 
you know, there was a hit and run and this person died and you know, I'm I'm saved. My son is struggling. But I'm saved. You know, the Schmitz, they got some struggles, but they're saved. So no matter which way it goes, no matter how that turns, I can flip that stone around any which way and I'm still prospering. Some rough days, sure. Some easier days. Take the good with the bad. Doesn't matter. I prosper because I have the precious stone. I have overcome the wicked. So, amen. All right, verse 9. Really? No, <laughs> just you, you missed the yawn. It was pretty audible up front. That you did you? Yeah, amen. All right, all right. My son did that one time. Where were we? We were in a meeting, and he's like, ah! I'm like. Ugh. Stop that. Do you know why? Can I talk to you? Let's talk. So how I feel right now, I'm just going to share my feelings with you. How I feel is that I'm putting you to sleep when I talk. So I might have to spend the rest of the service just like this. Talking to you. Just you, just you and me. Just kidding. But I'm not. <laughs> Verse 9. Verse 9. You know, people tell me I'm scary all the time. I don't know why. Proverbs 17 and verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. So this is an interesting dichotomy here in this verse. Personally speaking, here's what I know about the Lord. I know a lot of things about the Lord. Here's what I know about the Lord. He's gracious. Okay. And I, I can give you Job 33, 24 talks about the grace of God. Psalm 112, verse, uh, verse 4. Joel 2, 13. I, I threw a bunch of verses down here to just to talk about the grace of God. And I don't need them because I know Him. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I don't need the Bible. I'm just saying I don't need the Bible to know He's gracious because He's in my life. Now turn to Zephaniah chapter 2. Yes, there is a book called Zephaniah. Chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Okay? So, yeah, he's gracious, but he's also got a lot of, he's got, I don't want to say a lot of, he's got anger that has been built up for the wicked. Okay? But he is providing counsel here saying, listen, in the day of that anger, you can be hid. My grace can cover you in the day where I'm you know, just think back to uh, the time of Moses and the firstborn. And the day that all the firstborn of Egypt were dying, God's grace by that blood covered, right? They were hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Because the Lord desires to justify each and every one of us. Amen. He tells us, He commands us, to seek him. Seek me. That's what he's, he's it's a command. Seek me. I want to cover you. Listen, this w wickedness is not going to go unpunished. But I can cover you. And I can make you righteous, and then I'll deal with all the wicked that don't want to have to do with my righteousness. Should we seek him, he will be found. But he will be found in the person of Jesus Christ. Should we receive the person of Jesus Christ, he will pardon us, he will forgive us, he will cover. See that in the verse? He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. He will cover the transgressions of the past, the present, and the future. 
by the blood. Of which, going all the way back to the days of Pharaoh, that was just a type of what was to come. In fact, when the blood was put on the lintel, remember how it was put on the top and on the doorposts? You just draw a line through it. What do you got? It's a bloody cross. He was giving you a picture all the way back then. He was given he was given the nation of Israel a picture of their Passover lamb before he gave them the actual Passover lamb, which is also a picture of Jesus. He just gave them picture after picture after picture. He said, Christ is coming, the Christ is coming. You got all the prophets preaching about him. Here he comes, here he comes. And Jesus shows up and he says, If you'd known the day of your of thy visitation. You just read the scriptures. They could have discerned. That's the thing. They could have discerned the day to the day. The Lord's first coming. And none of them bothered. And then when it comes to the second coming, everyone's dating it when he says you can't. Isn't that just human nature? Hmm. Anyhow, because this is the character of the Lord this desire to, in love, cover the transgressions. Look at Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4. Because he then asks the same of us. And we say it all the time, like father, like son, right? How about the good traits? Why, not, why is it always just the bad traits? Like father, like son. Why can't it be the good traits? Like father... Like son, right? First Peter four and verse eight. Above some things, what does it say? Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. We need to. We need to. Every church needs to just like put post that up, with all underlined. Because this is not what we put above all things. And that's the truth. But, above all things, nevertheless, the scripture says, have fervent, fervent, not just charity, fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. What are we seeking? When we walk around with our finger out standard, extended like this, what are we seeking? Who's the accuser of the brethren? Really? If I didn't find that in the Bible, I'd think it's us. I'd say it's the brethren are the accusers of the brethren. How about that? I didn't know this was going that direction. It just kind of did. But Above all things. How about that? Have fervent charity among yourselves. I love it when... Right in the middle of a sermon, the Lord just, just says something to my heart. Right, with, right in just looking at the verse. That said, if I, if I continue in sin after salvation, um, which I will, but without an attempt to walk as he walked, it will grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the understatements of the Bible. You know, I grieve not the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's just, I don't know. I think there needs, we need to have put more weight to that. You know what I mean? We ought to care that we grieve the Holy Spirit. Um, not to the loss of salvation, praise the Lord, because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus Christ is a gift. Did you receive the gift? Then it's without repentance. What does that mean? He won't turn on it. Same with the calling. If he called you to a particular job, you might mess it up. But you did not lose the gift that was in you. Well, there's some of these preachers, they fall in a sin, and they can still preach the paint off the walls. And you go, Lord, I don't understand. You know, how, how is it that, first, I don't know that they should still be preaching, but the gift didn't go away. The gift never leaves. The calling is not supposed to go away. It's not supposed to. 
Shouldn't. Gifts and calling are without repentance. So you won't lose your salvation, but you will have a strain upon the relationship. Right? That's the part of the verse, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. So again, we're talking about, you've got to take it in the, in the context here. If we're going to deal with this thing, here the covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth friends. We're not talking about repeating as in, we're not ta- this isn't talk, this isn't speech. This is about doing something that's wicked, a transgression, and then it was covered on you, and then you repeated it. To which we all have to admit we do it to the Lord all the time. Right? So what do we do? We separate very friends. Didn't he say, I have called you friends? Yeah. So, I mean, on a practical level, we can do it with one another. So let's just say someone transgresses against me, and I forgive them, and I will, in love, I want to cover that. Well, I should, that needs to be the first step. It's got to start right there. I need, to, I need to be willing to cover it. Now, if they go back and do it again, what's that going to do? It's going to hurt the relationship. Does that mean I don't forgive again? No. Peter asked Jesus, how many times? Up to seven times? No, 70 times seven. That's 490. Pull out the calculator. Okay, you are at 374 right now. I think if you're getting to the 490 level, I think it pretty much means you're not counting it anymore. Right? So he wants forgiveness. He's always gracious. Man, he's just always gracious. But we can hurt that relationship. We can hurt relationships one with another by transgressing against our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we certainly do it to our Lord. So let's not put that separation between ourselves. Let's not put that separation between us and the Lord. We all need to have the Lord's mentality in it, a constant forgiveness And I think if we show that to one another, I think we're less inclined, hopefully, less inclined to continue in the transgression. I'm sorry, did anyone get saved? Did you become more or less inclined to continue in your transgressive ways? Why? Because he forced you? No, but by the love wherewith he showed you know, that he showed to us. That's why we love him because he first loved us. So that's, that's the inclination. I want, now I want to do what's right because you love me and I know that. So I got to love you back. So, now if we could just get that down with one another too. Anyhow, Those that continue in that sin, unrepentant, hey, you know, there's the other side of the coin. And Paul would admonish us that them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. So there's, you've got to be careful with the verse. You can't just go, let me give you, let me give you an example. I knew of a pastor who knew of Sexual sin happening in the church with the praise team. The young kids. I know we've got young, so I won't go into detail. They were doing things they ought not be doing. Okay? He knew about it. And when a few of the people in the church came to him about it, said, well, what are you going to do, Pastor? He said, well, I'm just all about grace. So they were just all about a church split. And that's what ended up happening. Because half of the people, half were like, okay, I don't like it, but, you know, he's letting it go. The other half were like, I can't believe he's letting this go. They didn't, nothing happened. Nothing changed. And that was to the detriment. So you can't can't just always cover everything, right? 
Some need to be rebuked before all. It just, it just is. And, that's, and there's provision for it in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 5 would talk about, you know, um, if they're unrepentant in the matter, then you, you know, it's all about if they're seeking forgiveness. That's what it comes down to. And, and if they're not, you'll know it. And then you're not required to give it. All right, verse 10. A reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. So we can just pick this up from the context of the previous verse. The wise man will receive charity because he's willing to receive reproof. When I got saved, I had to be willing to allow the scripture to tell me, you are a sinner. I had to let God reprove me. And because I allowed it, he covered me with charity. That's the wise man. The fool will lose his place among brethren because he's unwilling to receive reproof. Who are you to judge me? That's the stuff you hear all the time. Why don't you let me? What's the problem? Now, if I'm just judging what my finger pointed out because I want to find wrong, then sure, then yell at me. Don't judge me. But if we're just coming saying, I care about you, and I see this, this is going to hurt you. Parents, how would you like it if, I don't know, let's just make it your 10-year-old son. I don't know why I said that. Well, let's just say your 10-year-old son said, what, you know, when you said, did, 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 you put your, did you put your clothes away? Don't judge me. How do you think that would go over? And yet somehow, even saved people think that God is someone that would never dare judge. I mean, think about it. People don't read this Bible. Because when they do, they don't feel good. That is the equivalent of saying to God, don't judge me. How about that? It's pride. So if you want to be biblically wise, you've got to be more willing to hear reproof. You're not always right. I am not always right. Hopefully, when you let me know, I don't give you too much attitude. And hopefully, when I let you know, you don't give me too much attitude. Sometimes, sometimes even the wise need just a few moments to take it in. Right? So, you've got you to gotta be willing, and, and it's, not just about, it's not just about hearing the reproof. Because sometimes... So aren't we willing to sit down and somebody says, hey, well, I want to talk to you about something. Okay, all right, then sit down and talk. And the whole while, without actually doing it, you're rolling your eyes. So what were you willing to do? You were willing to sit down and listen, but that was it. But you find in the text, a reproof entereth more into a wise man so it's not just, okay, tell me what you need to say and I'm going to put on my Christian face so that you think I'm a good Christian, a good saved person, and I'm, and I'm, taking, and I'm taking your advice. No, you've got to let it enter in. Otherwise, you're still a fool. That's what it says. You've got to let it enter in. Stripes on the back motivate only so far. Even for children. Because eventually, it just doesn't hurt the way it used to. That's... The stripes on the back are meant for the fool or the foolish. Children are foolish. 
They do foolish things. That's why as they get older, it's supposed to be less about spankings. And it's supposed to be more about, let's talk. I want to show you where you're erring. And if you're going to be wise, and I'm looking at the young men now, if you're going to be wise, listen, not just with the ears, but with the heart. Receive it. Receive it. So, and here's a couple of cross-references, um, and we'll end with these. Got to let, gotta let that in. Uh, got to get it past the exterior and into the interior. Um, Proverbs 19, verse 25 says, Smite a scorner, and the simple will beware. Right? And reprove one that hath understanding, and he will understand knowledge. So do you see the difference there? The physical pain only goes so far, and it's meant for the scorner and the fool. And they're the ones that go, Oh, look, it, he just got whooped. I better... You're supposed to have more between the, ha between the ears than that. You know, and here. You're supposed to have more than that. The physical pain only goes so far for so long and it only works on a fool. But a man of understanding allows reproof to enter in and will become more understanding in the process. That's what that verse says. Now, last one for the night, Proverbs 9 and verse 8. It says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Now, isn't that interesting? Because a wise man will receive, he'll let reproof enter in, right? So, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. The scorner hates reproof, right? And he hates the reprover. The wise man may dislike the reproof. But he loves the reprover. See that? He loves you. He will love thee. I don't always like reproof. I don't always like rebuke. I don't want to hear it all the time. But if I know you're coming to me with care, and I receive that and I let that enter in, I'm going to love you for caring enough about me to say something. That's how it ought to be. So, more wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Any questions, comments before we call it a night? All right, Father, thank you.